This is going to be my first lecture over Master Harold and the Boys. There's probably going to be two or three of them, um, depending on whether or not I stick them together. I'm using the same edition that I gave to you guys, so you should sort of be following along with me on the different page numbers. Um, it's, um, it, it's important that you follow this lecture very carefully, but you don't have to watch it all at once. I'm just going to keep going and keep going, but you can pause and rest whenever you need to. My goal for today is to get through the first 23 pages, and that should give you the feedback that you need to do the homework assignment that I've given you. Before I go too much further, I want to say a couple of things about my early experiences with Atoll Pugard. Um, uh, Pugard is obviously a South African uh, playwright and novelist and a few other things, but I first encountered him in about my second year of college. That would be like 1986. So this play was already seven or eight years old. Um, but it was really my first introduction to apartheid and my first introduction into the political situation in South Africa. It's not something I'd learned in high school or ever before that point. My other early encounter with him was in 2005. Uh, Adolfo Gard was, his novel got turned into a movie called Sotsi, but it's got a weird spelling, T-S-O-T-S-I. The first T seems silent, Sotsi. Um, that novel became uh, an Oscar-winning film, and most people saw it in 2005. I don't remember much of the film. I remember a kid from a slum in Johannesburg steals a car, and after he steals the car, he realizes there's a baby in back. Um, I just want to say one other thing because I keep getting distracted, but I want everybody to see that my cat is sitting next to us, and she's going to be sharing in some of what I'm doing today. Um, I'm just going to start with the thing that all English teachers start with, and that's the title. Um, you should notice that the title is actually written in an interesting way. It's Master Harold, all in capital letters, in quotation marks, and then in ellipses, that's that three dot thing, and then and the boys. And boys is not capitalized. It's always written this way, and that's sort of like the official way that the title actually goes. Um, the play begins in 1950. Well, the whole play, it takes place over a day. Um, but it's 1950. We are in uh, the St. George Park Tea Room in Port Elizabeth. It's the, it, you know, the, the play begins as this kid comes home from school, Hallie. And the day is described as wet and windy. I really do want everybody to recognize that the weather is actually an important aspect of this play. Later in the play, Hallie says, you can't fly a kite in the rain. And the rain really does sort of contribute to the, the, the steady tone and mood of the play. It's dark and depressing, and so is, so is Hallie and his mood and his view of the world. So that actually is part of it. The three characters, of course, are Sam, who's in his mid-40s, Willie, who seems a little bit younger to me. Um, they're the... Um, they're the people who work in the tea room. And then Hallie, who's coming home, and his mother, of course, owns the tea room. The play does take place in the 1950s, but it, in, in many ways, this can be a very contemporary play. The page is all descriptions of the set. Um, and there are a few things there that sort of make this more like a 1950s um, soda shop than anything else. Um, but really, I think the most dated thing in, in it is the old-fashioned style jukebox. Um, but you can see where we are. Uh, the stage is actually pretty sparse. It has The tables and chairs are there, but they're all stacked up. That's important so that, the, that Sam and Willie can sort of dance around the room. Um, Sam and Willie are the first ones there. They are dressed like waiters. Um, it, I think it's interesting that they're wearing these white coats and, and uh, black slacks, and they seem like they're waiters at some place that's really nice, but the St. George's Tea Room doesn't necessarily have to be all that nice. It looks like a place where you go to the beach and then you kind of pop in there and you can get a Coca-Cola or some Cadbury's chocolate or coffee or tea or scones or a milkshake. 
it doesn't seem like it's that impressive of a place, but they are wet dressed like very formal waiters. I don't know, it might just be part of the time of the place. Opening scene, Willie is on his knees and he's singing a song, and at first it of course just seems like this sort of misogynistic but also sort of comical song about this woman who took my money, and even though she called me honey, but she's scandalizing my name. Um, called it love, but she was playing a game. It seems like it's a funny little song, but the theme of that song is that love hurts and love can cut you and love can love is all, and it that theme is sort of is like connected to the bigger themes in the play. Um, the the um, that idea that love is something that you know uh, causes a real conflict that's part of what this play is about. Um, right off the bat, you can tell that this is a South African play. Um, the um, Willie calls uh, Sam, um, it's spelled B-O-E-T, it means brother Sam, but um, is how I think I'm, I mean, I, my accent's going to be terrible, but but Sam uh, is how he refers to Sam and, and how they refer to each other. And right away, you can see that Sam is sort of the dominant adult character because he's the one that's teaching Willie how to dance. He also teaches Willie a lot of other life lessons, like the fact that he shouldn't hit or beat up his girlfriend. Um, Willie is preparing to dance in some in this big competition, but um, you know he can't get his partner to come to practice, mostly because he beats her. And he's angry with her because he believes that she cheats on him all the time. But it serves almost like comic relief, but at the same time it shows that they these are these men are desperately poor and that their uh, relationships are kind of fragile. So on pages five and six, um, sorry, four and five, Willie is dancing and Sam is sort of giving him instructions about how he should glide through it and, and things like that. Um, there's a mention of Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers. These were in the 1930s or so. These were two of the most famous people on earth. They made lots of movies together and all of their movies are sort of dancing movies. Um, it, even to this day, it's probably some of the most beautiful dancing you can see on film. But they talk about romance and they talk about love and, and they talk about how um, this art form that they're both keenly interested in, uh, sort of um, how you can be good at it, what values you have to have to be good at it, what you have to strive to achieve. And it's, it's clear to me that one of the things that Sam is trying to teach is that good ballroom dancing, it's all about aesthetics. It's how it looks to the audience. It has nothing to do with you and your partner you and your partner are working in tandem to present something to others. It's the one form of dance that's really very much so, well, it's not the one form of dance, it's one of many, many, but it really is meant to be seen by others. It's, it's not just something you do for yourselves. On page six, they talk about putting some money in the jukebox and they both decide that they can't. Um, they want to practice their dancing, but uh, Willie says he's only got bus fare home, so he can't put a sixpence, which is a sixth of a penny, into the jukebox. He also talks about his relationship with Hilda. He, I, it, it's kind of like he's counting on her to be his partner in this big dance, but he also believes that she's cheating on him, and he uses really horrible language. He calls her a fucking whore. Um, uh, and she and he's angry with her because she doesn't show up for practice. Now, part of this might be comic relief, but she's described as a really large woman, um, size 26 uh, suit. Um, so she's 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 at least a heavy set woman. Um, he also talks about it's spelled funny. It's called child well-fed, but he means child welfare and. He gives her a little bits and pieces of his money. He probably makes very little, but he has children by her. And so that's his relationship with her. But it seems like she has relationships with other men and he's just kind of furious about it. 
Sam on page seven asks Willie, when was the last time you gave her a good hiding? That means a beating. That means when was the last time you were really violent with her? And Willie tells him, oh, it was Sunday night. Um, that's, uh, and then Sam points out, oh, you beat her on Sunday and she didn't show up on Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday. I mean, Sam gets what he's, or sorry, Willie understands what Sam is saying. Um, but Sam is saying, and he says it like this, hey, you do this too much and too hard. You had the tra same trouble with Eunice. So we get a sense that this is actually Willie's character. He's capable of being violent, and he is sort of abusive to women. But he also really does care about this dance thing. And there's, for me, there's something about Willie that's very childish. Like, he doesn't understand, you know, how to have an adult relationship with a woman. Page 8 is a little bit of a joke. It's the buildup of a joke, anyway. It's this idea that um, what... Sam's sort of telling Willie to give Hilda this head start, like let her start dancing before the music starts so that Hilda can finish before the song finishes. Uh, essentially, you know, Willie's frustrated because his girlfriend dances too slow to keep up with the foxtrot, and Sam is just sort of making funny, fun of him. They are just teasing each other, and they don't exactly have an equal relationship. Sam is sort of the adult, but they are in fact teasing each it's Sam teasing Willie. Um, but um, sort of uh, in the middle of this, and in the middle of this mood where these men are laughing and joking and teasing each other um, and singing, then Haley comes in, also known as Master Harold. Um, he's described like this, um, a 17-year-old white boy wet raincoat and school case, he stops and watches Sam. The demonstration comes to an end with a flourish of applause from Haley and Willie. They're 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 friends. It's clear that these men are these men, all of them are friends. Sam is dancing and Hallie is and Sam both like applaud and are impressed by what he does. There's a kind of com camaraderie among the three of them that's sort of apparent right there at the beginning. And Hallie says, bravo, no question about it. First place goes to Mr. Sam Samila. Um, and Willie says, you was gliding with style, boat, boat Sam. Um, and they just sort of like, they all seem fairly happy to see each other. And there's a kind of like, it's joyful when Hallie first walks into the room. You should notice on page nine, near the bottom of the page, that Willie refers to Hallie as Master Harold. Um, it's important to understand what that term means. Um, when I was a very little boy, my aunt would send me letters, like in the real mail, in the snail mail. And when I was, you know, five, six, seven, those letters would be addressed to Master Anthony Dent. We've dropped that from the English language, and it was old-fashioned when she did it back in the late 60s, early 70s. Um, but it used to be sort of like there's Mr., there's Mrs., there's Miss, and for very young men, the term is Master. Um, it doesn't mean like uh, it, 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 it's, the, it's the prefix to a name, not the, not the sort of like uh, slave, master, relationship, although there is a slight connotation to that later on in the play. It does sort of feel like that later because of the oppression and the racism that exists throughout this play. You want me to call you master? Because quite frankly, Harold is, or Hallie, is too old for that prefix. He should be called Mr., um, not the, with the childish name Master. By page 10, you get the sense that what's happening here is sort of like a daily routine. Hallie comes home from school. He stops at this little restaurant cafe. He does his homework there. Uh, Willie and Sam give him some, you know, food for, for after school. And then he goes home after that. One of the things that happens that's different, the break in the routine, is that Hallie is uh, hears from Sam that his mother has gone to the hospital. Um, 
and that his mother will call him. This actually visibly upsets Hallie, and it's sort of the beginning of the conflict of the play. Um, Hallie seems afraid of his father. He definitely, definitely wants his father to stay in the hospital, and that means stay away from him and stay away from his house. I get the, as the play progresses, it becomes really obvious that Hallie's father is a terrible alcoholic, um, that he is a cripple, um, and that he is bedridden most of the time, um, and also that he's clearly sort of verbally abusive and perhaps violent, and he just seems like a horrible, weak, and yet really disagreeable human being. Hallie of course loves his father, but also he hates his father. The thing that you'll notice on page 12 is that Hallie isn't very good at school. He's one of those kids who seems smart and certainly thinks of himself as very smart, but he has a kind of, and again, it's just a kind of arrogance, where he's too good for school and he won't really apply himself to school, um, and so he just doesn't seem to do very well at it. Um, we know from, uh, from the other thing that's happening on page 12 is that it's pretty clear he does not want his father to come home. Um, Hallie says, uh, well, he tries to convince himself that whatever it is that Sam and Willie are telling him is just dead wrong and that he, his father's definitely not coming home. Page 13 is a little bit disturbing because it's a scene where uh, Sam and Willie are sort of teasing each other, and then uh, they somehow they disturb Hallie, and Hallie scolds them. Now, Hallie's like a high school age kid, and these are grown men, but he talks to about he talks to them and scolds them like he's superior, and it's just something is sort of like unsettling about it. It's clear that he, you know, he feels comfortable saying things like, act your bloody age, cut the nonsense now, and get on with your work, and you too, Stan, stop fooling around. Um, and then, but you can see what's, you can see that his anger and aggression towards Sam and Willie is motivated by his psychological disturbance at this phone call, and the idea, he's really quite afraid of the, of, the, of the notion that his father will be coming home. Um, he does say that, you know, I hope he's okay, but those lines are really, they're, they're, I, he, he's trying to be convincing, but we can see through it. He does not want his father to come home. He says, you know, things like, if anything, it sounds like he's more like he's had a bad turn to me, which I sincerely hope it isn't. Hang on, how long ago? So we get the sense that he's trying to convince himself that his father is not coming home, even though all the evidence and, and Sam's opinion is that he probably is. It's not really the same thing. Hallie's spanking in school and getting caned while you're in prison, those really aren't the same things at all. There's more, being beaten while you're in prison is probably much, much more severe. Nevertheless, in the middle of page 15, you get what I think is a really important theme for this book. Hallie says it. He says, I've heard enough, Sam. Jesus. It's a bloody awful world when you come to think of it. People can be real bastards. This reminds me of the most common theme on Cliff Notes, man's inhumanity to man. But that really is what it, this play is about. I mean, this play is about how awful human beings can be to one another. Um, the um, the other thing you should um, they mentioned Joan of Arc. It's a good example. Um, what they don't say is that um, you know, of course, Joan of Arc didn't get a fair trial and she was burned at the stake. Um, but Halley says, correct. If she was captured today, she'd be given a fair trial. It makes it seem like Halley is um, ignorant of the immorality and injustice of the apartheid system that he lives under. Like, it's probably a system where white people are given a relatively fair trial. 
but most people in South Africa are not given a fair trial or justice. In fact, the very structure of their government is an unjust system, an unfair system, built on a, this social hierarchy that, that values um, the white race above all others. There's a sort of strata that goes after that, where it goes white and then Asian and then um, uh, uh, what, what they call colored and then black. So this, this social stratification, which is immoral and is unjust, it, it's almost like Halley doesn't see what's right in front of him, or he doesn't see or understand the very world that he lives in. And the way he talks to Sam and Willie here is a really good indicator of that. On the bottom of page 15, Halley says, I know, I know, I oscillate between hope and despair for the world as well, Sam. But things will change. You wait and see. One day somebody is going to get up and give history a kick up the backside and get it going again. Like who? says Sam. And Halley says, they're called social reformers. Every age, Sam, has got its social reformer. My history book is full of them. And Sam says, well, where's ours? I'm at the top of page 16. Halley says, good question, and I hate to say it, but the answer is, I don't know. Maybe he hasn't even been born yet, or is still, maybe, is still only a babe in arms at his mother's breast. God, what a thought. And Sam says, so we just go on waiting? Halley, yeah. It looks like it. For me, what this really does, and I can't imagine that Fugger does this on purpose, but what everybody notices is how this sort of foreshadows Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela is in a South African prison when this play is produced, and he had been, and he has been for almost 20 years. Um, Mandela spends almost 27 years in a I think he does spend 27 years in a South African prison, and he's not going to get out until for five or six years after this play is produced. But that social reformer that they're talking about, that is Mandela. Um, you know, it's not a purposeful thing, but you can't read this play and know the history of South Africa without thinking about that while these men are saying it. On page 17, we get some more examples of... Um, Halley not being very good at school. Um, he fails his math exams. He seem, it seems like he fails tests all the time or doesn't really do very good at them. And he seems pretty happy when he gets an 80 on his uh, English test, English exam, without even studying. Um, the, for me, he seems like one of those kids who actually um, thinks that he's smarter than he really is. And he likes to have these sort of deep philosophical conversations, but really when you, when you know, he likes to talk about Darwinism, but of course he's never really read Darwin, or he likes to talk about philosophers, but he has this sort of Wikipedia knowledge of everything, and he uses that to sort of put on, to, to be this sort of pseudo-intellectual. And so in, in form, he likes to have these sort of pseudo-intellectual conversations with Sam and with Willie. What we discover in the play is that Sam has real wisdom. He's insightful. Um, he's not an educated man by any stretch of the imagination, but he has real insight into the human condition. And Hallie, if he weren't so ar arrogant and um, hubristic, he really could learn from Sam. But that his inability... Halley's inability to learn from Sam is part of what leads to his real suffering, especially at the end of the play. On page 18 now, Halley also seems like he's pretty bad at history, and that's actually really sad because it means he's going to fail to understand the history of the place that he lives. In, instead of, he's 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 not really got a complicated enough mind to understand the real social injustice of the world that he lives in. Halley's angry the whole play because the world is so unfair to him. The irony of that is he fails to see how really unfair that system of government is to Willie and Sam. And so 
Hallie constantly has this pity party. Um, Willie and Sam are constantly trying to make him feel better. But really, the victims of that society and the people for whom the world is not fair are Willie and Sam. Hallie has problems. He's got a father who's kind of weak and flawed. Um, he's got a mother who's distracted. Um, he's, he's an angry kid, and par partly because he's angry, he's not very good at school. And so he just doesn't have anything that is joyful in his life, and he also doesn't have anything that he's really good at. So in a way, you feel sorry for him, but he's also such a, a jerk sometimes that it's hard to like care about him or care for him. Um, the uh, on on page eighteen, it mentions this. Uh, Sam again picks up one of his history books, and he reads something about Napoleon. Now Napoleon was part of the Age of Enlightenment, and he wrote about this idea that all human beings should be equal and we should have sort of equal rights. Well, nothing's more of an affront to the apartheid government than this idea that everyone should have equal rights or equal representation. Um, so you can see sort of Halley sort of like his sort of institutionalized training against that sort of comes out and he isn't able to intellectually overcome it. Um, he just sort of like disparages Sam's ideas, and you get this sense that Sam's not really an intellectual enough. He's really more of a babysitter and a caretaker for Hallie, so he's not really going to seriously challenge him on these types of ideas. And, you know, that's that's seems like that's been Sam's role since Hallie was a very little boy. The next few pages, and I'm really looking at pages like 18, 19, 20, 21. I'm on page 19 right now. Hallie and Sam are having this sort of pseudo-intellectual conversation about what makes a person a man of magnitude. Um, this discussion really reveals more about Hallie than anybody else, because even these people who've made great contributions to religion or society or something, uh, Hallie likes to first really focus on their faults and their flaws. Um, the, um, uh, the, for example, Charles Darwin. Um, uh, you know, I think Charles Darwin is a man of magnitude, and I think he's changed the world in, in pretty impressive ways. And Halley does too, but Sam knows that yeah, Halley didn't really read that book. Um, it's actually not a very easy book to read, quite frankly, and so most people know Darwin on that Wikipedia level. But Darwinism, well, evolution, is a cornerstone of, of the sciences of nature. Um, and so, um, you know, you get it, but he doesn't get it. Um, this characterization of Haley as this sort of pseudo-intellectual, that's part of the arrogance that leads to his destruction. He believes he knows much more than he really does, um, because he sort of just knows the names of things. So on pages 20 and 21, they keep going on with this intellectual discussion about what would make a person a man of magnitude. Um, Sam mentions Abraham Lincoln, who freed the slaves, and for for me, this this part of the book is kind of a piece of irony because Halley can't see anything really great or profound in the accomplishments of Abraham Lincoln. Same with William Shakespeare. And for me, this is particularly important. Um, the fact that Halley can't really read or understand William Shakespeare, Sam either, um, makes it for, in Halley's mind, that means that Shakespeare is not all that great. But Sam understands that just because he doesn't understand Julius Caesar, doesn't mean that Shakespeare isn't doing something that's really profound. So um, Sam gives Shakespeare that benefit of the doubt, that there is something magnanimous there. They also mention Leo Tolstoy, the Russian. It's this idea that, again, we're talking about somebody who thinks that society is more should be more just and should be more equal. Um, and, um, and, you know, he's also a pretty great writer, and, but uh, or Winston Churchill, we talk about these different man of, men of magnitude, um, but uh, then on page 22, we turn to Jesus. 
Now, one of the things Halley says is that he's an atheist, and because he, and because he's an atheist, that allows him to sort of discredit everything else, everything that every religious figure ever put forward. Jesus can't be a man of magnitude if you don't really believe in him. So that becomes sort of Halley's position. That, I mean, I, I don't... The, the thing about... I, I can see why Fugard made Halley an atheist, because it, it, makes him, it gives him a kind of arrogance. He just seems to be this guy who knows everything all the time. And you can't tell him or anything new. Or, and that's one of the reasons he struggles in school. You also can't teach a person like this much. They just don't want to listen to other people. They just want to say their own thoughts out loud. Yeah, I get the irony there. Okay. So I'm going to put up the lecture for um, the, second, the second and third lecture for Master Harold and the boys in a couple of days. What you guys should be working on for the next two days are the first four questions, and you need to teach yourself how to use QuickTime so that you can answer those questions and then uh, connect them all together. I know that this isn't the best way to do this, but I really am proud of you guys, and I hope you'll sort of all rise to the occasion and, and, and be as positive about what's going to happen in the next uh, few weeks or months uh, as you can. Uh, please stay in touch with me, but remember, don't touch anybody.